Right now at ABC 10 News at 4, younger migrant children being moved into the San Diego Convention Center today. How the shelter is making room for the new arrivals. Plus, as the United Kingdom mourns the death of Prince Philip, we're going to take a look back at the Prince's royal visit to San Diego and his impact on those he met that day. And a positively San Diego couple bringing understanding of people with disabilities. The new project from the creators of Camp Wall. ABC 10 News at 4 starts now. Hundreds of teenage girls seeking asylum at the San Diego Convention Center have now been moved to Texas to make room for a group of even younger migrant children. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Atkinson in for Kimberly Hunt. Our ABC 10 News reporter Mimi Alcala is joining us live at the Convention Center where some of the kids have already arrived in San Diego today. Mimi. Hi, Steve. Yes, what we're learning is that the convention center now has room to house up to 300 of those young children under the age of 12. So far, 37 are already here. They arrived here earlier today to the convention center and 222 just approximately are expected to arrive into the night. They've got some really young children, very young children, and they think our convention center setup is the best location for them. Friday, a plane believed to be carrying young migrant children arrived in San Diego. The kids seeking asylum here in the U.S. will be staying at the convention center for about a month as they're processed and connected with a verified family member or sponsor. This time, the group of kids is much younger than the teen girls that arrived in March. We're told their ages range from 5 to 12. The convention center can only house up to 1,450 children, so 300 of the migrant teenage girls that were here before were transferred to another site at Fort Bliss in Texas. Their casework will continue there. It's so moving uh, to see how grateful and appreciative these children are. County Supervisor Nathan Fletcher says the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services asked for the county's cooperation, saying this would be an appropriate site for these younger kids. Services have been provided by South Bay Community Services and Rady Children's Hospital. The federal government is taking care of expenses. To accommodate more kids, HHS will also be increasing staffing on site. They say adjustments will also be made to the contracted services for mental health, education and food. According to data obtained by The Washington Post, the Biden administration appears to be spending at least $60 million a week to care for the thousands of minors and shelters operated by HHS. And the costs are expected to rise in the coming months. When, when you look at the trillions of dollars we spend on building walls, the fact that you would spend a couple million dollars to uh, provide care for people who have a legal right to be here seems like an appropriate expense. And one thing to note, none of the children housed here at the convention center that have COVID-19 will be transferred out at any time. Reporting live downtown, Mimi Alcala, ABC 10 News. Mimi, thank you. You can stay on top of this story and more on the migrant children arriving in the country with the ABC 10 News mobile app. It is free in the App Store and Google Play. Memorials are lining Buckingham Palace today as Britain mourns the death of Prince Philip. Prince died just this morning in Windsor Castle at the age of 99 after 73 years of marriage to Queen Elizabeth. The Duke of Edinburgh was born as the Prince of Greece and Denmark in 1921. After the countries were overthrown and lost power, his family then fled to Paris when he was just a baby. Eight years later, Philip was sent to England to be raised by his grandmother and his uncle. Prince Philip served in the British Royal Navy from 1939 to 1953 and fought in World War II. He married then Princess, now Queen Elizabeth, in 1947. Britons are remembering him fondly today. He was just everything, you know, he's done so much for this country. He's been a rock to our Queen. It's just, yeah, just really emotional. Prince Philip was the oldest serving royal spouse. He was known for his love of painting, horses, flying, sailing and environmental conservation. Prince Philip would have turned 100 years old on June 10th. And tonight, San Diegans are sharing their memories of Prince Philip from his royal visit to San Diego with the Queen back in 1983. Our ABC tennis reporter Michael Chen talked with two people who met the Prince in two different settings. On a Saturday in February of 1983, water and gun salutes ushered in a royal visit. We are live at the Broadway Pier and there is Her Majesty's Yacht Britannia, bearer of Queen Elizabeth and her husband, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh.
Thousands at the Broadway Pier welcoming Queen Elizabeth II and her husband, Philip. They went on a tour of the harbor and an aircraft carrier. Prince Philip, a decorated Royal Navy and World War II veteran, was also the founder of the World Wildlife Fund. He would visit the San Diego Zoo, where he received a walking tour. He and the Queen also making a stop at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. It was a bit of an unbelievable experience. Where research physiologist Jerry Coyman in the Tan Blazer talked of his research into the amount of energy marine mammals used to swim. Prince Philip stayed after for a few minutes to pick his brain. He was very engaged and uh, very interested in animals, but especially why these seals can dive so deep. I liked him. I thought he was pretty down to earth person, <laughs> especially because he was asking questions that I like to be asked. <laughs> also that day, Prince Philip and the Queen met with local and state dignitaries, including a dinner and reception on the royal yacht. The next morning, they would attend morning prayer at St. Paul's Cathedral in Bankers Hill. He was kind, courteous, a true English gentleman. Dean of the Cathedral James Carroll says Prince Philip read aloud a lesson of Holy Scripture. After the service, he went off script, visiting with the choir. With the choir, he had some words, especially with the children. They were delighted. They called him Your Majesty. One moment of a royal visit that left a lasting impression in San Diego. Michael Chen, ABC 10 News. A lot of history there, and you can see the complete video of our special coverage of that royal visit that day on our website at 10news.com. New numbers from the CDC show that more than one in five Americans are now fully vaccinated. A third of the country is in the process of being vaccinated and has received at least one shot. About three million COVID vaccines are being administered every day. And new COVID case numbers are averaging about 66,000 a week. That's about what we saw during last year's summer surge. And today, our Strategic National Stockpile, or SNS, is in much better shape than when the pandemic started. Our partners at Newsy collected numbers from the Department of Health and Human Services. They found there are 25 times more N95 masks and nine times more ventilators than last year. Surgical masks went from 31 million to more than 270 million. Experts say the pandemic has completely changed the way the stockpile functions. A big part of what we're seeing right now is a shift away from just let's put more things in the stockpile to let's really reimagine all of the ways in which we can use the stockpile partnerships, strategic interventions and investments to make product available or have the flexibility to produce product on the fly. She also says Congress should keep the money flowing to the SNS so the nation isn't caught off guard for the next health crisis. Now to our continued coverage of the murder trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. Today, the doctor that performed the autopsy on George Floyd took the stand. Court TV legal correspondent Shanley Painter joins us from Minneapolis with that testimony. The doctor considered one of the most critical witnesses in the Derek Chauvin trial takes the stand Friday afternoon. Dr. Andrew Baker is the chief Hennepin County Medical Examiner and he performed George Floyd's autopsy. He ruled Floyd's cause of death to be cardiopulmonary arrest, complicated law enforcement subdual, restraint and neck compression. I'm having your, you know, your cheek up against the asphalt, an, an abrasion on your shoulder. Those events are going to cause stress hormones to pour out into your body, specifically things like adrenaline. And what that adrenaline is going to do is it's going to ask your heart to beat faster. It's going to ask your body for more oxygen so that you can get through that altercation. And in my opinion, the, the law enforcement subdual restraint and the neck compression was just more than Mr. Floyd could take by virtue of that, those heart conditions. The key part of defense attorney Eric Nelson's strategy is to convince the jury that other factors such as pre-existing medical conditions and the presence of fentanyl and meth may have caused George Floyd's death. Dr. Baker could be the final witness as week two wraps up in this trial. For week three, we could see the end of the prosecution's case in chief and the defense take over testimony. That's the latest from here in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Chanley Painter with Court TV. Workers are saying overwhelmingly they do not want to return to the office full time. A hybrid work schedule that lets employers and employees both get a little bit of what they need may be the direction that more companies are considering. In a new survey from staffing agency Robert Half, 49% said working part of the time from home and part of the time in the office is what they prefer. They found that nationally around 60% of job ads they're seeing are still saying fully remote, but they expect at least half will be hybrid as more things open up. Major companies from Citigroup to Ford to Target have all said their workforce 
is going hybrid. Number one question that I get, uh, I mean, I get hundreds of emails, is what can uh, an effective hybrid post-pandemic workforce look like? How do you even put it together? How do you make the decisions? How do you ensure that um, uh, people remain equitable, people coming in and out, fluidity? So Dahl Neely with the Harvard Business School started looking at virtual work arrangements almost 20 years ago. She says global organizations have had their workforces spread out for decades and still maintain their culture through virtual collaboration. Let's not mistake physical proximity for emotional and psychological closeness or feeling of intimacy with your organization. That's not what's going to make it happen. You know, you will see some turnover if, uh, if employees are forced to do something that they just no longer feel comfortable with. And so, you know, being able to work through that on the front end is going to cause a lot, uh, you know, uh, diminish a lot of heartache, I guess, on the back end. Karen Warren, a district president for Robert Half, says companies over communicating the return to the office plan will help in the long run. It's also on you to ask your coworkers and manager what their plans are. Neely says companies doing an anonymous survey of their entire workforce is also going to be important, asking them how many days a week they want to be in the office. She says they also have to take an honest look at every position and set new values for how to operate going forward.